Well, good morning, everybody. So good to be with you. Thank you so much for joining us for our, our worship service today. <laughs> you can tell that I'm so used to leading worship. Um, it, it's really good to be with you. I'm very excited to be able to preach. I'm really sorry about last time I preached. I did not realize how much I was bumping where I have my computer resting. I didn't realize it until watching it later with you all. I was so embarrassed because the screen and everything kept moving. And so I was getting nauseous. So thank you all so much for not like saying, like embarrassing me. So I want to call myself out. I'm really sorry. So I've got things much more stable now. So if I do move around, there should be a, a whole lot, um, a whole, sorry, a lot less moving around. So let's pray. Uh, let, let's, uh, let's, let's start with some prayer before we see what God uh, wants us to know today. So gracious Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you've called us to love you, to love our neighbors, that we are not judged, we're not found. Your, your criteria for followers of Christ is not based on wealth, is not based on knowledge, is not based on who we are through genealogy or you know, social economic standing or whatnot, our color, our gender, our race, whatever. It, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we are in Christ. And what matters is that we love you and love those around us. We thank you. Please open our hearts, open our eyes, and open our ears that we will be fertile ground, that the seed of your word would be sown in us, and that it would bear fruit. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this is a passage that a seminarian, as myself, does not like to hear. Uh, <laughs> let's go back to the text. Now, about food, sacrifice to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone thinks he knows anything, he does not yet know it as he ought to know it. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. So I've been in a very long academic journey from community college to undergrad to now my final semester at seminary. And now I had the prospect of looking to go forward for a DHM. I like to think about how much I know. I've written several papers. Now, I know that people are listening to this who have doctorates, and they're like, oh, you have yet to begin to write. And I understand that. I respect that. But let me have this moment. And so I like to think about what I, I know. Um, there's so many things that when people talk about when, when I go home or when I go to other friends and they all start talking about, hey, I had this thought about scripture. Outside, I'm like, oh, tell me about that. I'm so excited. But inside, I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, whatever. You have no idea. If only you knew what the original word in Greek said, oh, you won't be thinking that. Oh, that's what you come to? Oh, pfft. Well, that was, we got read it back in like third century. Like, come on, where have you been? <laughs> Maybe not that much, but a bit. I'm tempted a bit for that. And so we get to this verse where it's all about knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And if anyone thinks he knows anything, he does not yet know it as he ought to know it. I think that's a phrase that resonates more with PhD people, doctorates, that the more you know, the less you know. I think people in the graduate levels like to think what I know is what to know itself. One of the things I have I love researching is World War World War II. My brother got my younger brother, he got me the bestest present ever. I have been reading the Dickens out of this book. Um, I love World War II. The more there is to know about World War II, the more I love to read it. And what I find is the more I read about World War II, the less I actually want to talk about it because I realize how little I know about it. I just watched two documentaries the other week, trying to distress from class. I read, watched two documentaries and discovered that just how much I had misunderstood so much within World War II. So... The more you know about something, actually, it is, it's, knowledge isn't like filling up a bucket. It's actually realizing how small your bucket is and that you're in need of getting a bigger bucket. And Paul is kind of bringing that into the church. 
he's challenging some people who are kind of puffing themselves up with knowledge. They've, they've got a, a pretty good understanding of stuff. But Paul is calling them out on this, and he's really challenging them as to what do you really know? Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. What are we using knowledge for? How are we using knowledge? Paul is addressing a very legitimate concern here. People within the church are, have been asking him, can we eat food offered to idols or can we not eat food offered to idols? There's some within the church who are saying, my dudes, but what's the deal? It's, it's an idol. It's, it's stone. It's wood. There's no problem at all. Eat the food. Nothing happens. God is above that. That doesn't matter. What's your problem? But then there's other people in the church that their whole life they've seen food offered to it. Their souls, their, their understanding of spirituality has been really, um, I guess, strange. It's been, what word am I looking for? This is why I should look at my notes. Malformed. Their understanding of spirituality has been mal malformed to the fact that for so long they have been believing and behaving in a certain way as to believe that that idol was a very real representation of what was happening in the spiritual realm. That there was very much a God within that idol. And so for them... It wasn't a question of whether or not they could have it. They simply couldn't have it. For them to enact, to eat that food that's been offered, is going to trigger for them uh, memories. It's going to trigger for them responses. And so for them, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. no, we can't. See, I already bumped it. No, we can't. We can't have food offered to idols. So Paul is using this very real um, crisis happening in the church to humble both groups, actually. So let's see what happens. If anyone loves God, he is known by him. Before we jump into the question, before we get into how he answers the question, we have to look at where does knowledge really fit into our relationship with God? You might know God. You might know he exists. That's good. You might know what he wants. Good for you. You may even know the law. Really good. You may know that there is no spirit in that idol. Great. But that's also what the devil knows. The devil was quoting scripture to Jesus on the mountain. So we know that the devil knows. So knowledge alone is not enough to be known by God. To be known by God, you have to love God. Remember in judgment, or remember when Christ prophesied that in judgment day, that the goats and the rams would be separated on the left and the right, and those going to hell would say, hey, what about me? And Christ said, depart from me, you evildoers, I never knew you. And then he says to the other ones who clothed the poor and the needy and the hungry, who cared for them, who loved others, Jesus says to them, come in, good and faithful servant. To be known by God is not based on what we know of him, but it's based on our love for him. In John 1, it tells us, how can you say you love God if you don't love your brother? whom you've seen. How can you say you love the one you don't see when you can't even love the one that you do see? How does that work? Our, the proof of our love for the one we don't see is seen by how we love those we do see. So Paul says straight off the bat, now about food, sacrifice to idols. This is something you've all been waiting for. I know you want me to put my opinion here. You want me to just say yes or no. You want me to say either yes, eat the food or no, don't eat the food. But I'm Paul. I'm the apostle Paul. Have I ever given a yes or no answer? 
I would have said no, but Paul would not have said just no because it's Paul. He would have given a big answer as to why he had never said no. So here we go. Can we eat food? Can we not? Not. People have been waiting for this. We all have knowledge, okay? But knowledge puffs up. But love builds up, okay? So now we're asking ourselves, well, what's the purpose of knowledge? What's so good about knowledge if not without love? If anyone thinks he knows anything, he does not yet know it as he ought to know it. So knowledge isn't bad is what he's getting at. It's just you don't know what you really know right now. What we think we know about God cannot be compared to what we don't know. We could barely understand. I mean, look, we don't even understand the ocean for crying out loud. We have more understanding of the moon than we do of our own ocean. So what do we really know about God? What do we really know about what's going on in idols? Yes, it's very good that you know that we can eat food to idols. It doesn't change it. The act of what has gone on has not happened. Our God has power over their gods. But do you actually know? What do you know? So if anyone loves God, he is known by him. You think you know God. But do you know if God knows you? So, verse 4. About eating food sacrificed to idols, then. We know that an idol is nothing in the world. That's quotation. He's speaking about what they're saying. And that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father. All things are from him, and we exist for him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things are through him, and we exist through him. That's good. That's great. We need to know that. This is something we need to know. That there is but one God. And he is the Father. And that all things are from him, and that we exist for him. The food, like it doesn't, food cannot separate us from God. You have God, us, food isn't even in, in, in that category, that, that purpose. God created us for him. Food nourishes us. Food is created to nourish us. It can't get in the way of it. So very good. You need to know that. We need to know this. And we exist for him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things are through him and we exist through him. So again, we have this wonderful connection to God through Jesus Christ. One God over all. All things are in existence over him. That's good. We need to know this. But maybe we're puffing ourselves up by knowing this because what is knowledge without love? However, not everyone has this knowledge. Some have been so used to idolatry up until now that when they eat food sacrificed to an idol, their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us too close to God. We are not worse off if we don't eat, and we are not better off if we do eat. But be careful that this right of yours in no way becomes a stumbling block for the weak. For if someone sees you, the one who has knowledge, dining in the idol's temple, won't his weak conscience be encouraged to eat food offered to idols? So the weak person, the brother or sister for whom Christ died, is ruined by your knowledge. Now, when you sin like this against brothers and sisters and wound their weak conscience, you are sinning against Christ. Food doesn't bring us closer to God. So congratulations. You know that there's, that there's no problem with eating food to idols. Congratulations. But did you really think that your relationship with God is based on your diet? That by eating one thing or not eating another thing, other thing is going to affect your diet? Are you so consumed with what you can have before you that you would risk somebody else's relationship with God? Where's your love for your brother? How can you say you love God if you don't love your brother? If you're putting your own appetites, because that's really what it comes down to. This is a practice in pride. Knowing that you can do one thing and doing it at the expense of another person is satanic knowledge. Satanic knowledge is all about the self. 
It's how it can puff itself up, how you can benefit from it, how you can enjoy it. Did God really say you can't eat from every tree of the garden, good and evil? Why can't you have this? It's before you. Yeah, he manipulates and turns things. But it's always about pride. It's always about what you can get. It's always about what I can get. It's always about how we can enjoy ourselves more, how we can puff ourselves up. Knowledge that puffs up is satanic knowledge. You're sinning against Christ by taking this food, knowing that, oh, it doesn't hurt me, so I can do it. But yet it causes somebody else to stumble. He says, you're sinning against Christ. What you do to the least of these, you have done to me. When you saw the stranger and you clothed him because he was naked, when you visited the, pr the prisoner in jail, when you cared for the widow, when you cared for the least of these, what you did for them, you did to me. That's what Jesus says. When you cause one of them to stumble and fall because of your liberties, you are not following me. You're following yourself and you're sinning against me. That's what Christ is saying. See, oh, we love our liberties. Do not infringe on my liberty. What's, what's our favorite, uh, what's the flag that was so popular during the revolution is now gaining grounds that don't tread on me, don't touch my liberties. What's the purpose of having liberties if not to sacrifice them for those around us? That is what knowledge does for us. Knowledge infused with love is not so much how can I have more liberty, but how can I better love those around me? I know that f this food, eating this food, will not affect my relationship with God. But because that it'll hurt that person, even though I know that I can have it, I know it's my right, it is actually my right to eat this food, I'm not going to take it. Because I'm going to serve them. I'm not going to take for granted what is due me. But instead, I'm going to step down and I'm going to serve them. And you might say, well, that's nice, huh, Kadari? But then let's hear what Christ says. This is what Paul says to the Philippians. That you all adopt the same attitude of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself to, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. What are we doing with our knowledge? A proper Christ, to be as Christ, our proper response is in knowing I can give. The more I have, the more I can give. The more liberties I enjoy, the more liberties I can give for others. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. We're called to serve each other. We're called to build each other up. Now, when you sin like this against brothers and sisters and wound their weak conscience, you are sinning against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother or sister to fall, I will never again eat meat so that I won't cause my brother or sister to fall. That's what Paul is saying. Because Paul loves God so much, he can't help but love those around him. And his love for God is proven by being able to say that. So what is it in our life that we have liberty of? But for the sake of someone else, we're going to give it up. In a class I had, a missions class I had, of all places, a missions class where we get to learn to be missionaries and whatnot. Here at Esbury, we get to learn how to be missionaries. The professor asked us, how or what do you feel about yoga? Do you think it's right for us to do yoga or not? The entire classroom said, yes, yes, we should do yoga. We should do yoga. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just stretches. I feel good after I'm done with it. It's so wonderful. But there was one student in there who's from India. And after the entire classroom had said how beneficial yoga is, because, you know, there's some health benefits. You get more flexible. There's actually, yeah, weight loss, de-stressing. It helps with depression. There's a lot of benefits for it. 
And there were everybody in the classroom was bringing up these benefits. The person from India, though, they came out and they said, no, we, we cannot do that. Because they were they were originated from. And for them, they had only ever seen it. They see they saw where it came from. They were exposed to the spiritual realm of it. The prayers you do, the meditations you do, the forms themselves are not stretches. The forms themselves are religious poses. You do the poses so that way you are you're mirroring, you're getting your body into sync with what you're praying. Everything about it is it's a physical and spiritual combination. Your physical is mirroring what you're praying. That's what's happening in yoga. And so the person from India was like, no. As Christians, you cannot. Now, of course, other people stepped up. There was somebody there who was a yoga instructor. So they stepped in and they were like, no, you don't understand how we Americans do it. It might be wrong for you, but it's all right for us. And they got into a fight about it. Who was in the right and who was in the wrong in that situation? Are you going to tell the person from India, oh, your conscience is just too weak. Just get over it. That's what the instructor said. But we wouldn't do that. Oh, of course we wouldn't, because we're good people. I mean, if obviously you're watching the sermon, you're part of this worship series because you're a good person, and you're perfect, and you know all things. And that's why you're here. It's for affirmation. You want me to tell you that you got it. So what is in our life that we have liberty over? 2020 was a perfect example of people arguing for their rights. Some people were a lot more justified than other people. Some people had to relinquish certain liberties, and that didn't sound right. Because it's the American way. I can't give up my liberties. I'm not going to call out names. I won't use examples. <laughs> but we saw a lot of people who were willing to injure other people for the sake of liberties. What about certain means of entertainment? When we have somebody over, well, we can't anymore. We used to have movie nights. Well, I never remember having movie nights so many times. Game nights, things like that. How often do we invite people over to do something we want without getting to know the person themselves? Maybe something happened in their life and they can't eat certain food. Maybe something happened in their life, they can't watch certain movies. It's all right for us. We have a lot of liberties in Christ. Like, for real, the kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink. What are liberties that we're holding on to so tight? I'm going to zone this in on us. If there's other viewers here who are not American, if you struggle with this too, well, then kudos, let's struggle together. But for a lot of us, for those of us who are watching who are Americans, what are the liberties that we're holding on to that are preventing us from loving? We're so knowledgeable about what our rights are, about what the Bill of Rights is, the Constitution. But how well do you know your neighbor? How do you know them well enough to serve them? Paul is saying, very good, you got knowledge, but guess what? The beginning of our knowledge is, of God is just that, it's a beginning. We can't comprehend him. There's so much more we don't know. Don't rely on your knowledge, but lean into our love, our love for God and our love for our brothers and sisters. So this week, on this Happy, wonderful note. Remember that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. This is something I should tell a professor. I should really tell a professor this. You know, hey, hey. But anyways, they're grading me, so I'm going to give them what they want. What are liberties that we're holding on to that's preventing us from loving those around us? Let's pray. 
Gracious Father, we thank you so much that our relationship with you, that you meet us, that you sent your spirit to us before we even knew you, that you just want us to love you. Inspire us to know you more that we may love you more. But may our knowledge be infused with love. May our knowledge be inspired by love and not by pride or arrogance. May not be a satanic knowledge, but may be a Christ-centered knowledge, a knowledge that inspires us to serve those around us, to humble ourselves to, to the point even of death, death of ourself, death of our liberties, death of our bodies for those that we love. May our love for those around us prove our love for you. Give us more opportunities to serve, more opportunities to sacrifice, that in seeing us they may see Christ at work. We thank you as this in Jesus' name. Amen.